Let's talk about the Pac-12 North. And yes, I will reiterate, I understand that the Pac-12 has done away with divisions. I know, starting this season. However, we still got the divisions from last season, etc. I'm going to go through it in the same order uh, based on how they finished last year. Obviously, we'll start off with Oregon. But this year does mark a bit of a change. The two best teams are going to play regardless. It is based on winning percentage. So the two best teams, even if they are from the quote-unquote same division, say it's Oregon and Washington State. I mean, those are the top two in the North from last year. But uh, Or Utah and USC. Those two can play in the conference title game this year. It's a bit of a change. But I'm totally fine with it. I think it helps the Pac-12 get a team in the playoff because you don't have to worry about upsets. You don't have to worry about any of that kind of crap. So we'll start off with... Da, 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 and let's make sure that, uh, you know, we can we can actually boost that up a little bit so you can see it better. All right, we'll start off with the Oregon Ducks here. And uh, let me write down times. Good gracious. I know you guys love when I do this. The Oregon Ducks, Dan Lanning, the new head coach. Of course, they went over and hired the head coach away from Georgia, uh, the, the former defensive coordinator at Georgia, who had the number one defense last year. Of course, Georgia losing a ton on defense, but you look at some of these numbers, they were number 26 in PPA per drive, they were number 83 in defensive PPA per drive allowed, give you a PPA margin of number 44, so last year, uh, not great, like remember they stayed in the top six for a long time until late November when they got shellacked by Utah, but the numbers were never there, they, they held on to that win over Ohio State in week two, like it was gold for the longest time, and it was an interesting conundrum because obviously the numbers showed you that they were not a great team, even though they were stacking up wins against weak competition. You you had to have them go up against somebody decent, and they went up against Utah, but they had that win over Ohio State, and the playoff committee did not know what to do with them whatsoever. Looking at their season win total, uh, they well, not win total, looking at their uh, season record, 10-4, and four, Last year, their post-game win expectancy was 9.74 and 3.26. So, very close to uh, to that 10-3. and 3. They went 10-3 and 3 before the championship game, obviously. Uh, but yeah, they, excuse me, 10-2 and 2 before the championship game. So, yeah, they that's about what they were supposed to be. 10-3 and 3, uh, between that and the championship game. Uh, this team returns 61% of their production from last year, but I don't know that you would believe it if you just started going down the roster and looking. Uh, Their roster strength is actually sitting at number 11. I was slightly shocked at that. I know that they've got a stacked defense. Defensive roster strength actually number 6, courtesy of our guys over at CFB Winning Edge. But uh, this was was a little bit surprising. Um, The returning production, not great. Well, let's start off with the offense here. Let's start off with the offense. The new offensive coordinator, Kenny Dillingham, he was at Florida State. He was at Auburn. He was at uh, Memphis for a while. He has really worked with, he worked one season with Gus Malzahn, and the rest of the time he's been with Mike Norvell, but he did know Dan Lanning. Dan Lanning, of course, used to work at Memphis under Mike Norvell. Uh, He was at Alabama for a bit, went to Memphis, then went to Georgia, and developed into this uh, defensive coordinator guru, whatever. Uh, Still really young guys, but... Don't forget, Bo Nix, of course, has a relationship with Kenny Dillingham from when he was at Auburn back in 2019. I expect that Bo Nix is going to be the starter based on spring game, based on all of the intel that I've heard out of Eugene. Uh, I, I got to know who is going to be the skill position playmakers. Uh, maybe it's UCLA transfer Chase Coda. He's coming in. The offensive line is going to be strong, and I think that Bo Nix is going to have more protection at Oregon than he had even at Auburn. Right, I, that on top of the fact that I don't know how many edge rushers you're going to be dealing with the likes of what you saw in the SEC when you're in the Pac-12. I think this is a bit of a downgrade in competition for Bo Nix, which could certainly be a good thing for him in his last year as a college quarterback. Uh, on top of that, I mean, this team is going to benefit greatly, I think, from having a a new philosophy on offense. Right, Dillingham is a young guy that is going to like to push the ball. He's going to be aggressive. Uh, This team only averaged 11 drives per game last year. That's eighth fewest. They only attempted 19 fourth downs. That was number 87 in the country. 
uh, I would expect that we will see a massive change. And you are not just going to be this rushing juggernaut, right? Last year, rushing success rate, they were number three in the country, but passing success rate, number 64. And a part of that is the fact that Anthony Brown was maybe better at designed runs than he was at throwing the football. Bo Nix, I think, can be both. Bo Nix, not great at designed runs, but he can certainly escape the pocket. I mean, you all saw what he did against LSU last year. Just absolutely absurd. Uh, so the offense is going to look a little bit different, and I think it'll be better. Uh, one thing that could change, they were number 18 in the country in turnover margin last year. You get aggressive, you start taking a few more risks, that turnover margin might change. Might change a little bit. So we'll move on down to the defense. Uh, defense should uh, you'd certainly be aggressive under Dan Lanning. You know, they've got the pieces to be able to do almost anything that they want to do. Uh, d- they are stacked, even with losing Kayvon Thibodeau, of course, to the NFL. Linebackers are going to be awesome, led by Noah Sewell, and uh, and Justin Flo was supposed to return this fall. Everything appears good with him after missing most of the spring. Um, they got five defensive linemen with 330-plus snaps that played last year. Secondary added transfer Christian Gonzalez to go with the cornerback Hill and uh, in the safety Stevens the fourth. Uh, this, I mean, this defense is stacked, absolutely stacked. Uh, it, that first game against Georgia, those rosters are not that far off. They're really not. With what Georgia has coming in, these brand new faces and whatnot, I'm interested in what these two teams look like. Like, it, it, does Oregon come out intimidated right off the bat? Like, that line is 17 and a half. It's just ridiculous. Uh, the top players here, Bo Nix, Noah Sewell, Brandon Dorless, the defensive tackle, Chase Coda. Uh, from uh, of UCLA, I wanted to say USC so badly, uh, Sam Taimani, uh transfer in defensive lineman, and Christian Gonzalez, of course, the cornerback coming over from Colorado. They uh, they stacked up from the transfer portal, did a pretty good job, like hit very specific areas of need, and I think it was very smart for them. Uh, as far as keys to the season here, returning 9 of 12 regulars on the offensive line and defensive line which is a great starting point you got to make sure that you are strong in the trenches here you got to figure out the running position after losing Die and Verdell uh is it a new and improved Bo Nix how does he come back from his injury last season you know uh, he was really good for Auburn before the injury they they started out 6 and 2 last year or does he end up being sporadic is he not great uh once he get it, uh, gets into game time etc uh, what do you end up doing with Ty Thompson like, is Ty Thompson going to end up starting before the end of the year? If that's the case, things have probably not gone well. On top of that, how different does this team look with Dan Lanning compared to Cristobal? Cristobal was very risk-averse. He was aggressive on defense, but as far as offense goes, he never wanted to take chances. Uh, this is this is going to be different, I think. I think Dillingham is going to be aggressive, and then you got to look into how is the defense going to change under Lanning, as opposed to what Cristobal was able to do there. Uh, my record prediction for them is 9-3. and three. So I've, I've got a loss to Georgia, uh, I've got a loss to Cal, and I've got a loss to Oregon State. Now, at the same time, like this team is talented enough, they should beat everybody on the schedule. Like I've got a win over BYU at Washington State, uh, Stanford, Arizona, UCLA, uh, Colorado, Washington, and Oregon State. Oh, I, I said uh, a loss to Oregon State. I've got a loss to Utah again. But would it shock me to see them win all these games? I, it wouldn't shock me if they beat Georgia in week one. Like Nothing would shock me about this, but Dan Lanning, of course, coming in as a first-time head coach, that is going to be a little bit tricky. So I do expect some losses and maybe some in spots that you wouldn't expect, like, for instance, going to Cal. So 9-3 and three is where I have the Oregon Ducks. Next on the docket, the Washington State Cougars. Led by another new head coach, Jake Dickert. Now, he led this team to a 4-3 and three record down the stretch before losing the bowl game. Nick Rolovich, of course, was fired for not getting the jab. And, of course, in Washington, it's, uh, it's just a little bit different up there. Just a little bit different. So, uh, post-game win expectancy for them last year, uh, they were 7-5 they were and five heading into the bowl game. Their post-game win expectancy was 5.5 wins roundabout. So either five and seven or six and six. So they actually outperformed. And a big part of that was the fact that their turnover margin was number nine in the country. Uh, they were able to get, like they garnered a lot of takeaways, just a ton of takeaways last year. This year is going to be a little different. Like they, they were average last year on pretty much everything. PPA margin number 66, right? And when you look at these numbers, 66 on offensive PPA per drive, 
number 62 on defensive PPA per drive. Uh, looking at the offense to start off, right? You're going to lose Max Borgie. That hurts. You're going to lose uh, the right tackle, Abraham Lucas, uh, the wide receiver, Travell Harris, et cetera. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff, uh, which I just realized. I put Travell Harris on there twice. Uh, you lose Jaden DeLara as well. Now, that one may not sting as much because you are bringing in a new OC along with a new quarterback. The new OC is Eric Morris. He was the former head coach at Incarnate Word, and he was Cam Ward or Cameron Ward, whichever one you'd like to call him, the new quarterback. He was his head coach at FCS, uh, or at the, the FCS level. They were the number four FCS scoring offense, and they like to fling it around the ball yard. Um, he Cam Ward is the future for this offense. And this is somewhat similar to what Western Kentucky did with Houston Baptist last year, where they took Houston Baptist's offensive coordinator along with the uh, the quarterback, and like several wide receivers, et cetera. Like they just brought like a whole offense over. They're not bringing an entire offense. I think there's one other incarnate word player that is transferring with these guys. But for the most part, this is bringing in a play caller and a quarterback and putting him with all the pieces that you already have. Right. And they've got some guys, but eh, you know, stribbling should be awesome. I think uh, they've only got four starters back on offense, though. So you, you got to kind of make this thing gel. Very quickly, uh, the running back, Nakia Watson, he played in the bowl game. I think it was 17 carries for like 62 yards, something like that. He was the only running back or is the only running back on the roster with any kind of snaps from last season. Uh, this is going to be a completely different offense. Like they are losing a lot of offensive linemen. They are losing playmakers. They, like this is going to be crazy, crazy to see. But everybody is hyped about Cameron Ward. So, eh, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, returning production for this team is number 99. They're returning 56% of their production, and it's number 112 on offense. That's going to get tricky. That's going to get tricky. The defense was actually pretty good last year, number 62 in PPA per drive. Um, Jake Dickert was the defensive coordinator. Like <laughs> it's So it would make sense that the defense was pretty good if they were going to hire him to be uh, the head coach after hiring him as the interim. But, uh, but number 56 in returning production on defense, 65% there. Uh, but their roster strength is much higher on offense, number 65, than it is on defense, number 81. Uh, they went from 38.5 points per game in 2020 to only 24.2 points per game in 2021, thanks in part to Dickert there, who is now the head coach. Even with 65% returning, like this, the stock is pointing down for the defense, I would imagine. I don't know that you're going to be able to generate that many turnovers uh, this coming season. Number 62 in PPA per drive last season, which I talked about, uh, th they couldn't stop the run, though. I mean, they were number 105 in defensive rushing success rate allowed and number 100 in yards per rush allowed. Like, and they were plus 11 in, in turnover margin. Like, I think that kind of tricked fans into believing that the defense was better than they were. And don't get me wrong, there is an art to getting turnovers. You can be aggressive and find a way to force more turnovers. It's There's still a bit of luck involved with that. So, this one's tricky. This one's certainly tricky. Uh, keys to the season, uh, nothing matters other than the quarterback, Cam Ward. If he clicks with the wide receivers and the offensive line protects, like this offense can go to the moon. They absolutely can. Defense likely still won't be stopping a whole lot. Turnover's probably going to regress. Uh, watch out for the linebacker, uh, Henley from Nevada. I think he could play really well for that defense, especially in Dickert's uh, scheme. The new head coach, Jake Dickert, still has a lot to prove here. Uh, what he did down the stretch was pretty impressive. You know, a four and three down the stretch, made it to a bowl game, destroyed Washington. I think you're going to see a little bit of revenge here. There's not a lot of experience that's coming back on the field. He, How much time has he had to work with them, et cetera? This could be interesting. Um, I've, got, I've got a record prediction different here than what I had uh, over there. And uh, you guys can't see that anyway. So um, I had six and six down here. I think I moved it over to five and seven. I mean, we'll see. It is hard. This is a very difficult job in Pullman. Um, and while I could see them winning a sixth game, I think I think it's going to be very tricky. Projected SP plus record here is five and a half and six, five and a half wins and six and a half losses. So anywhere from five and seven to six and six, like I think they're going to be the the lower side of that. I think five and seven. I mean, it's a pretty tricky schedule. You got to go to Wisconsin. 
I think the win or a game at Colorado State or against Colorado State, that's going to be a win, especially early in the season as they're trying to get acclimated into a new scheme for Jane Overell. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you got Oregon and Cal early. You got at USC, at Oregon State, Utah after a bye. You play at Stanford. Even the wins that could be easy wins, uh, quote-unquote easy, even those could be difficult because you've got them on the road, right? So this is, uh, this is going to be a tricky one. Uh, but I've got them at five and seven, and you know we'll we'll hope for the best. How's that? So I think I think everybody in the country, just a little bit, other than maybe Washington fans, pull for the Cougs a little bit. I will say that. So we'll move on to the Beavers, Oregon State, and they had a pretty awesome year last year, if I do say so myself. Uh, Jonathan Smith has really kind of turned that program around, and he has made them very entertaining. Uh, Jonathan Smith, they are they went seven and six last year. That was seven and six against the spread as well. But their post game win expectancy said that they should have been eight point one three and three point eight seven, so closer to eight and four than the seven and five that they were in the regular season. Remember, they lost the bowl game, the the L A Bowl to Utah State. Uh, this the projected SP plus here is seven and five. I'm having a little bit of trouble with that. Their offensive PPA per drive last year was off the charts, number six in that regard. Their defensive PPA per drive was completely opposite, number 87. So not the worst in the country, but still not very good. Turnover margin, number 57. Penalties per game, number 99, et cetera. Uh, This team, I'm I'm having trouble figuring out what they're going to do because I I trust Jonathan Smith to have a really good offense. But they lost some big-time playmakers, um, even even though they have a lot of returning production coming back, they're number twenty two in the country, bringing back seventy five percent, and on offense they're bringing back seventy four percent, on defense seventy five percent. So you know, top thirty in basically every metric for returning production, and the roster strength gets me a little bit. They are losing uh, Beeson, they're losing Bradford, the two wide receivers, they're losing BJ Baylor, who took a huge chunk of the carries last year. So that that could be a little bit of an issue. They lose uh, the center Nathan Eldridge. Now you got plenty of options at quarterback. Chance Nolan, et cetera. Um, I would imagine he'll be starting, but you never know. You never know. Uh, I don't know that it's going to be a massive problem. I just think that you could see a bit of a drop back because the rushing success rate was number two in the country, and passing success number thirty one. I don't know that you can continue to run at the same clip without BJ Baylor, but obviously we'll see. Uh, does the offense stay the same? Like, their rushing rate was 60-40, rushing to pass. Like, they ran the ball 60% of the time last year uh, and still had a, a hugely successful offense. Uh, they lost uh, the top wide receiver, Bradford. There are playmakers there, though. FSU transfer, Harrison, Lindsey, etc. They got four offensive linemen back with 380-plus snaps. Like, there are ways that this can then that this whole thing can work. But, again, you lose some, some real star power here. Uh, on defense... Tibisar, the defense coordinator, was fired after the loss to Colorado last year. Trent Bray came in and proved them from giving up 405 yards per game in the first eight games to only giving up 346 in the last four. Uh, now, obviously, strength of schedule matters a little bit there, but uh, still, they got 75% returning production here on defense. They were number 87 in PPA per drive um, and number 85 in points per scoring opportunity. So people were able to finish drives on them. And they got to find a way to get stops, really. They got nine starters back on this. And I, I think they could be better in year two under Bray. I just, you know, I've got to see it from them. I've got to see it from Jonathan Smith. He's never put a focus on um, on defense. Uh, watch the linebacker Omar Spates. Watch the, uh, the nickelback Jaden Grant. Those guys are going to be a lot of fun to watch uh, for sure. Um, Let's talk about keys to the season. The offense was incredibly explosive or incredibly efficient last year, but not very explosive. They were number one fifteen in explosive play rate last year. Um, can they add that element to the offense? They were number fifty eight in twenty plus yard plays, number sixty five in thirty plus yard plays. Like maybe that can give you a little more separation in some of these games if your defense does not exactly hold up. Defense, of course, like I said, returns nine starters. Can they improve from giving up? Uh, they were number one excuse me, number 81 in points per play allowed. 
I, I'm going to be very curious to watch what Bray does with this defense if he tries to uh, maybe install something a little different than what he did at the middle of the year last year. They need to improve both turnover margin, number 57, and penalties per game because that is how you have a uh, post-game win expectancy of 8.13, but you only win seven games, right? Like, you take care of the football, you don't beat yourself. You should have had eight wins last year. So, uh, record that I've got for them, six and six, you know, not bad. Not bad. I I think uh, I've got a loss to Boise State in a win at Fresno. I mean, swap those around. I, I expect you to go one and one in those games. Like, you'll lose to one of them, I would imagine. Uh, but if Jonathan Smith has this thing rolling out of the gate, I mean, they could they could easily win both of those. And on top of that, a win over Montana State, but then you run into a gauntlet here. Uh, USC at Utah, and then I've got a quote-unquote schedule loss at Stanford. I don't know that Stanford's going to be very good, but you have to play them on the road after playing USC and Utah. I think this is a body bruise game. Uh, then you've got Washington State after that, Colorado at Washington, Cal at Arizona State and Oregon. I got losses. I mean, I've got them at 6-6, six and six, right? Like, I just think that they are going to be right down the middle. They're going to win games that you don't expect them to. They're going to lose games that you don't expect them to, much like they did last season. So, 6-6 six and six is the record for me on Oregon State. And let's hit some more ads, and we'll hit the other three on the backside. Let's take a break from the show for just a minute to give you some info on things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter, at Winning Cures, or you can follow the guys at GaryWCE and at Chris B. Giannini, or you can also follow us on Facebook. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show, and from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. Got your own podcast or web show, looking to start one, or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now... Back to the show. All right. We will continue on with the Cal Bears. And Justin Wilcox had an opportunity last year to head to Oregon to take that job. And he did not do it, which I, I'm a little surprised by. Went 5-7 and seven last year. Uh, went 7-5 and five against the spread. Their postgame win expectancy says that they should have won six games uh, the turnover margin was good, but the penalties per game, number 75, that wasn't great. Their offensive PPA per drive was actually not bad, number 58 in that spot. Defensively, number 57, they're used to being a little bit better than that. Uh, this was a, a strange, strange season for them last year, but they do lose Cameron Good, the uh, linebacker. They lose safety Elijah Hicks and uh, cornerback Josh Drayden. I, that's, that's massive losses. I mean, just massive. Uh, they lose a couple of really good offensive linemen in Daltoso and Metauer. Uh, he transferred out. I hope I said that right. Defensive end J.H. Tevis transferred out as well. They uh, they lost wide receiver Kakoa Crawford as well. Looking at the offense here, Purdue transfer quarterback Jack Plummer joins. He tries to improve on the number 96 uh, passing success rate here. Offense only returns 31% of production. This team overall, by the way, only returns 45% of their production from last season. That's number 126 in the country. There's only 131 teams, so that's definitely not good. On offense, it's even worse than that. They are number 127, and they only return 31% of the offense. So uh, that number 58 for the offensive PPA per drive, probably not going to be up there again this year. But uh, you never know. I mean, Plummer was okay when he played at Purdue last year. Um they were number 58 in PPA per drive. They were number 96 in points per game. They were number 89 in points per scoring opportunity. Wilcox's offense has got to find a way to start finishing drives and and maybe be a little more aggressive. Um, explosive play rate, they were number 96. Passing success rate, number 96. Like They were good at running the ball, uh, but this is going to be tricky this year. Certainly tricky for that offense. Um uh, I, at what point do they 
do they have to swap staff? What what point do they have to figure out? Like we got to change our offensive philosophy. That's what I'm waiting to see uh, on defense. I mean, this should be another top forty unit, even though they're. I mean, they're number seventy eight in returning production, sixty percent coming back. Um, they they added the linebacker Jackson Sermon from Washington. They added the defensive end Xavier Carlton from Utah. Like even losing seven to fourteen players that had two hundred fifty plus snaps, they still got dudes. And and Wilcox's system works. Like that scheme absolutely works. They were number twenty one in defensive points per play last year. Uh, linebacker and defensive line are strengths, even with losing six of their top eight tacklers. Like this is just a, a trust issue. Like I, I fully trust. Uh, and if you're watching on the screen, you're seeing me try and keep myself from sneezing because my God, my allergies are acting up here. Um, they lost six of their eight tacklers, and this is faith in Wilcox and his defense. Like, I fully believe that he is going to find a way to have a good defense, and I believe that he will fully find a way to not have a very good offense. That's what he's done basically all the time. Uh, the top players here, I, I put Plummer on here. I put uh, center Matthew Sendrick on it. Uh, Daniel Scott, the safety linebacker, Jackson Sermon that I just talked about, and Xavier Carlton. Uh, those guys, I, I really got a lot of faith in. So, Wilcox uh, had the opportunity to take the Oregon job. As I mentioned before, he passed on it. Like, does that buy him even more time at Cal, even if he can't get the offense going? Um, you got to keep the turnover margin. If you can't get the offense going, you at least got to keep the turnover margin about where it was. It's number 11 in the country. Uh, you can't be turning the football over. You can't beat yourself, for sure. Uh, defense got to get better against the run. They were number 51 uh, in yards per rush allowed, number 98 in rushing success rate allowed. Like, that is not going to cut it in the Pac-12 for sure. Uh, I've got them at 6-6. Six and six. i got to make it a bowl game. I, I like Wilcox. I like what he's doing, and I feel like they should have made a bowl game last year. And, you know, you find a way to beat yourself a couple of times. So, definitely not good there. I've got wins over UC Davis, UNLV, Arizona, at Colorado, and a win over Washington, and a win over Stanford. Now, Anybody that they have lost to, or that I've got them losing to, I could see them beating. Anybody that I see them beating, I could see them losing to. That's what's tricky about this team is you don't know what you're going to get really from week to week other than a great defensive performance. They just have to find a way to score points to win games, and they make scoring look so hard. Like, I don't understand how they do that. So, I, six and six is, is the way that I'm rolling on this, but man, like they, this is a tough team to read every single year. You just imagine they're going to be a right around that break-even point because they'll win some that they're not supposed to win. They'll lose some they're not supposed to lose. This is what's crazy about the Pac-12. There are a lot of these teams that are just like this because things get crazy. Like, we all know about the hashtag Pac-12 after dark. You all know how this works. All right, we've got two more for today. We will hit on the Washington Huskies here. And i got to tell you, I like the coaching hire. Kalen DeBoer. This team went four and eight last year under Jimmy Lake, and uh, and did not look good at, at all. I mean, there's a reason why they had to fire him after two seasons, and one of them being a shortened COVID season. Everybody could tell that that thing was going south in a quickness. I mean, it was ridiculous. So uh, their post game win expectancy four and a half wins last year. So yeah, you know maybe they could have won five, but it wouldn't have mattered. I mean, <laughs> none of that stuff would have mattered. They had plenty of uh, talent to be able to do it. Roster strength sits at number 30 in the country, number 38 on offense, number uh, 30 on defense. Returning production this year is number 81. I don't think that that's necessarily going to matter when you're bringing in an entirely new scheme on offense, and and for the most part on defense as well. Um, Last year's offense was a complete disaster. Number 106 in PPA per drive. Uh, The rushing success was okay, number 53 there. But passing success rate was number 82. They were number 126 in explosive play rate. Like, this is really bad. I mean, just really, really bad. And and obviously, I mean, it's not that Washington expects to be a throw-it-all-over-the-yard kind of team. They don't expect to go full air raid here. But you got to have some downfield consistency or just a threat of it. And Dylan Morris was not able to do that. Um, Penix was productive in DeBoer's offense. Like, I would imagine he'll be the starter. Uh, Heward probably backing him up. I don't know that Dylan Morris will see the field again at Washington. They they got eight starters back on offense. Um, 
which is kind of crazy. <laughs> That's It's a weird number here. Uh, if you see on the screen there, 76% of their offense is returning, and that's number 26 in the country. Uh, 55% of their defense is returning, and that's number 97, which is what gives you that number 81 overall. Uh, you know, at this, there's obvious talent here that was bogged down by incredibly conservative play calling. I mean, it, we talked about Oregon being conservative. This looked Oregon looked downright explosive. I mean, it was it was really, really bad. Um, you got to wonder how quickly DeBoer can improve the offense. Like, is this an overnight fix? Like, if he just installs, um, if he installs uh, Penix Jr. like with a good offensive line and Penix is healthy, then does that fix everything? That's I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think I think there's enough talent. I think DeBoer is quick enough at installing offenses. He'll be able to he'll be able to fix this thing. As far as the defense, new DCs are William Inge, and I hope I say that right, and Eric Morrell from Fresno. And that team was surprisingly good on defense last year. Go look at the numbers. Yeah, go back and watch my uh, my Fresno preview from not that long ago. This team, the edge rusher, Zion Tupeloa uh, Fetui. <laughs> He's back from an Achilles injury. And I did not say that right, and I apologize. And you guys can jump in the comments and tell me how wrong I butchered that. Good gracious. Uh, transfers Cam Bright from Pitt and Chris Mole from UAB. They help at linebacker. Experienced at the safety position. Cornerbacks could be an issue. Defensive line has talent, but they were awful against the run last year. Number 114, rushing success rate allowed. If you are Washington and you have this kind of defensive talent, there is no reason why you should be letting teams just run the ball all over you unless, once you get later in the season, you have just quit. I'm just saying, just throwing it out there. Looking at the keys to the season here, you got to strike now if you are Washington, which is why they fired Jimmy Lake. Uh, changes at Oregon, Cal's lack of offense, Oregon State's lack of defense, a new coach at Washington State, Stanford's down, et cetera. Like, you've got to strike now in the Pac-12 before USC really gets going, and it might already be too late. Like, you might have hired, you might have should have hired Kalen DeBoer or somebody like that last year. Like, I mean, it really, you know, I, the hiring of Jimmy Lake was really interesting. Very interesting. Regardless, off of that, number 97 in returning production on defense, uh, you're you're probably going to need the offense to step up a little bit, especially early. Uh, you start out with Kent State, Portland State, and Michigan State. And then you dive into conference play against Stanford, and then you got two road games back-to-back -back at UCLA, at Arizona State, uh, expect the turnover margin to clean up. I mean, they were number 111 in turnover margin last year. The change in quarterbacks should should help clean that up just a little bit. Um, but even still, like, you're going to be taking more risks, which is crazy. Like, as conservative as they were last year, that turnover margin is putrid. Uh, penalties per game is perfectly fine here. I've got this team going 8-4. and four. I trust DeBoer, and, and I like their schedule enough that I think that they can be successful this year. And so I'm, I'm going to roll with... Kalen DeBoer to take them to a bowl game to to completely flip the record. Like, I think this team could be really good. Especially, you hit on quarterback, and, and I think one of them will do well. Either Heward or Penix is going to do good things. So, I'm I'm all in here. Uh, I like Washington. I like them at 8-4. The losses here, I've got Michigan State at Cal, at Oregon, at, uh, da, 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 at UCLA, at Cal, at Oregon. There we go. Um, again, these are tricky. Very, very tricky. I do want you to leave some comments, though, and let me know what you think about this record because uh, some of these are, are tough to figure out. Real tough to figure out. And speaking of tough to figure out here, we're going to move into the Stanford Cardinal. And I don't know what is going on at Stanford. Like, they are still recruiting at a pretty decent pace, especially for Pac-12 standards. Like, it, this team, when I pull up this graphic, it, it's just, there's so much red. There's so much red, and red is not good on these graphics. Uh, their postgame win expectancy last year was 2.82 and 9.18. They were 3-9 and nine last year. And so, the postgame win expectancy was exactly what they were supposed to be. 
I guess one thing that you can look at as a positive sign is they have 79% of their production returning this year. That's number nine in the country. Offense, 88% production coming back. That's number four. The defense, 70%. Both the offense and the defense were pretty bad. Both of them really bad against the run. Um, the offense couldn't run the ball. Defense couldn't run or couldn't stop the run. Like at number 115 in offensive PPA per drive, number 106 in defensive PPA per drive. Uh, I mean, you just look at all this. I mean, PPA margin, number 115. Net points per drive, number 108. Total plays per game, they were all the way down there at number 119, so they didn't even really take chances. Uh, turnover margin, number 124. And then finally, like penalties per game, okay, number 68. Like that's not bad. Um, I just cannot figure out for the life of me uh, what they are doing here. Let, let's talk about the offense first. <sighs> offense coordinator Tavita Pritchard has been on staff since 2010. He's been the offense coordinator since 2018. Like, yes, you've got a lot of returning production here, 88%, in fact. But what does that mean for a team that was so bad? Like, just because you have players coming back does not mean immediate improvement. Like, if you bring back crap players, they're they're still likely going to be crap. So were these players crap, or was there something else going on? I understand, like, the wide receiver Higgins, et cetera, uh, McKee even, like, they all missed time with injuries at certain points last year, et cetera. There were, there were a lot of injuries. I get that. Totally makes sense. But, I I mean, they were so bad, and I cannot figure out how to how to make them jump up, right? Uh, Tanner McKee returns. After they beat Oregon, they lost seven straight to end the year, and the offense had less than five yards per play in the last five games. And I understand McKee missed two of those. I got you. But even when he did play, like this offense was not good. Uh, what to know about the defense here? Like, how long is Shaw going to stay loyal to the defensive coordinator here, Lance Anderson? Like, the defense gave up over 200 yards rushing in nine games last year. Uh, that's putrid. 5.74 yards per rush for the entire season. They gave up 33 rushing touchdowns. Like, this defensive line had talent. Uh, and now they lose two defensive ends, a defensive tackle, and two linebackers, etc., like, this is rough. 106 in points per play allowed. Number 107 in total scoring opportunities. There were only 58 drives. Of, this is going back to the offense. I should have put this back up there. Um, on offense, they only had 58 drives that made it into the opponent's 40-yard line. I mean, it, it, it just don't get any worse than this. Uh, you look at some of the top players that they got coming back. Uh, the linebacker, DeMooney. Uh, the safety, Williamson. You got the cornerback, Kai Blue Kelly. Like, these are all... Pretty stud dudes. Wide receiver Elijah Higgins, the left tackle Rouse, the quarterback McKee. Like they have got players. I've got to know what's going on here. The efficiency is completely gone from David Shaw's program. I I understand people wanting to be loyal to their assistants, but you got to change something. Like something's got to change. Um with that much talent, this team should never be as bad as they were last year. Fixing the turnover issue is probably gonna help a lot. Uh, this year, but I mean, you got to be able to run the ball and you got to be able to stop the run. Like I've got them at four and eight because I I want to believe that they will be better, but I didn't want to go too crazy. So you know, a one game improvement, yeah. Like, could I see this team getting to six and six, maybe? But my gosh, I mean, you start out the season with Colgate, and you know that's an obvious win, but then you've got USC. Then you have a bye week. You have at Washington, at Oregon, Oregon State, at Notre Dame. Now, I've got a win over Oregon State here because I didn't want to believe that they would open up, you know, one and five. But after that, I mean, it doesn't exactly get a lot easier. You play at UCLA, Washington State, at Utah, at Cal, BYU. I mean, I if <laughs> this is what's so tricky about this. At Stanford, like, you you already know that you haven't been very good for, like, the last, what, three years-ish, somewhere around there. Like, it's it, it, things have not been great. Why would you, if you already schedule Notre Dame in the non-conference every year, why would you ever add BYU? That just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, because I think that they're going to lose to BYU and Notre Dame this year. And then you've got that whole conference schedule 
where your road games are Washington, Oregon, uh, UCLA, Utah, and Cal. Like, I don't know that they're going to be favored in any of those. Like, this is just a, a tough situation here for Stanford. I've got them at 4-8. and eight. Maybe they'll do better. Like, I like Stanford. I've been to Stanford. I, I want them to do well. I like David Shaw. Yeah, I mean, he's an old-school kind of guy, but I don't see... Uh, I don't see a lot of great things coming on the horizon for the Cardinals. So that uh that is going to wrap up our show for today. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com. And if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter at GaryWCE, at Chris B. Giannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.